In the late 1970s, Don Shire began his relationship with the Yanomamo, who lived deep in the rainforest of Venezuela. His friendship with Shufoot, chief of the village of Koshaloateli, or Honey Village, has spanned those years even to the present. The Yanomamo are recognized by anthropologists as the most primitive culture known living today. Complaints are often heard from anthropologists about the damage missionaries do to the Yanomamo culture. Rarely do the Yanomamo ever have the opportunity to speak for themselves. In June 2001, Don Shire and his son Andy embarked on a 300-mile evangelistic canoe trip into the interior and unreached villages of Shufoot's youth. Towards the end of that trip, Don asked Shufoot to share his testimony for you to see and hear. A former shaman, Chief Shufoot, talks about his journey from witchcraft and demon worship to his faith in God. Missionary Mike Dawson was there to translate and has verified that all you are about to see and hear is as it was told that afternoon by Shufoot. Shufoot, who now goes by the name Bautista, which means Baptist, refers at times during his testimony to Joe. Joe Dawson is the missionary that was able to help Shufoot understand who God is and why he sent his son to earth. The following presentation is a true story from a man whose life has been radically changed because of Christ. I'll never go back. A shaman's story. I would just like to make it clear that if just anybody asked me to share this, I would hesitate to share it because a non-believer is not really going to understand everything I'm going to say. But with you, it's like I'm with a brother and it's like I've come back and I see you and I want to tell you. It's like your family, like your father or your younger brother, older brother. You've been around, you've been doing a lot of stuff and you've come back and now you're excited to share with your family what you've been doing. That's how I feel with sharing this. Because I consider other believers in Christ to be my family, to be just closer than my family, then I'm not afraid to share this and I'm not afraid to really let people know exactly how it was before. When another Christian asks you about your old life, you can figure that he had the experiences where Christ changed him and he knows what change you're talking about. So you have a reference point to start with so you can share what Christ has done knowing that you're going to be understood. So if a non-believer, just anybody, comes up to me and asks me about my old ways of life and what I was like, I really, like I said, would hesitate to tell it because I think, well, what do you want to know that for? Why do you want to hear that? I'm not interested in just telling for fun or just to make people amused, amuse people in other words. Like I said, I consider you all to be my family, so I don't hesitate in telling you. When I see people, other believers from faraway lands where your father Joe was from, then I know I can share and what I want to share, and I'm happy to see you and happy to share it. But some people, you see their spirit, and it just isn't friendly. And it's like you're looking at an enemy, and that's how it is with non-believers when they want to just hear you. When I traveled in your country, I saw everybody, and people were friendly, and although I was far from my home, far from my wife and my children, I would get very sad. Then I remembered the fact that I was one in my spirit with my friend, and he's my family, and all of you too. And then I was happy to keep going. So now I'm happy for this opportunity to share my testimony with you all, to share what God has done for me so that you all can listen also to what I say and think, yeah, that sounds right. And that's what God did for me too. The change that he's talking about, yeah, I know that change. And you can say that to yourself. As we've been traveling back up this river, and I've been thinking about the old life, and where we traveled from, and the way that my people came, it's brought back a lot of memories. And I think about my childhood and how I was first becoming. Because at that point, I didn't know anything about a god. And the only thing as I knew was the things that my Barakaba, my elders, were teaching me. And I just think that they were right. Everything they told me was right. They were my authority. 
My early life was filled with taboos, things that I couldn't do. One of the things they told us was that, don't be a pig, don't eat hard. And I listened to that. And then as I got a little older, they began to tell me that even though I was still too young to, for most people, for most children to start drinking the bones of the dead, that they could see in me that I was somebody that was special to the spirits. So I needed to go ahead and start drinking bones, then so that it would make me more susceptible to it. And even so, at a very early age, I began to drink the bones of our dead. I was taught to drink bones at an early age. And one of the reasons they do this to people like myself is so that we grow up with hate, with the desire for revenge. Bones are never given to you to drink so that you like people or learn to love people or be real friendly. It's to make you always desire revenge. And you begin to dislike people and to hate people. So I drank the bones, and along with the drinking of the bones, they began to blow dope up my nose. And that was to make me susceptible and to make me easy for the spirits to contact. And not just anybody would blow drugs up one's nose like that. It would be the master, the head shaman who would do it. And he would say, I'm doing this to give you my breath. In other words, his power over the spirits would be transferred through this abena at this time. This master would say, I'm doing this so that you begin to think like I think. And so desiring that power that this master had, then I let him blow the dope up my nose. This is how they taught me then. And this is how in so many other places, they are still doing it even today. And I know now it isn't right. And I'm not saying it's right. But this is how we teach. And they teach you so much saying, don't do this and don't do that. And looking back, so much of what I was taught was strictly given to me so that I would learn not to like men, but to hate men. Once they got you to the point from taking dope and drinking bones to where you just hate everybody, then the head shaman will get to you to where you begin to learn about the spirits. And the first thing they do is they tell you to just take dope all the time. And the head guy will begin to blow dope all the time and he'll say, take my breath, take my breath. And he'll blow drugs into your nose. Then when the effect of the drugs was such that everything was dizzy, everything was spinning and everything, he would tell me to sit real still and he'd put me in this posture right here here where I'd put my arms on my knees and I'd sit there and he'd tell me to sit real still and just stare at him. Don't look at anyone else. Just stare at me, he would say. Just stare at me. And everything else would be spinning and he would be the one focal point there. And then I'd begin to notice that he was no longer dancing alone. The Hecula or spirits were dancing with him. And everybody else that were looking around that weren't under the influence of the drugs like I was, they would just see this man, this witch doctor, dancing by himself. But I saw that he was dancing with many spirits. He's dancing with his spirits, and all of a sudden I see coming towards me Ola Liwa, the tiger spirit. Now remember, these aren't my spirits. These belong to the master. And the tiger spirit is approaching me, and he's coming towards me, and the master says, don't be afraid, let him lick you. And I was just scared to death. But I sat real still, and Tiger Spirit puts out his tongue and begins to lick me. I was petrified. 
But because of the master, I sat there quietly and let him lick me, and I was scared to death. But he says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, just sit still and nothing will happen. And so I just sat still, as he was the master. And then, another demon comes dancing toward me, with his bow and arrow drawn, aimed right at me, ready to shoot. And at that point, I really thought I was gone. I really thought that was it, because he looked like he was ready to shoot at any minute. Because I was trained by masters, that's why I can say that I have been trained and I know what I'm talking about. I was trained more and more and got into it deeper and deeper. And the more I was trained, I began to see that there was a trail being made. A big, wide trail made by the spirit of the pigs. While Aliwa were making this trail, coming down towards me to bring the spirits that were going to be mine. Behind them are coming all the other spirits, all dressed in the pretty feathers of the hawk and the down of those feathers, and they're all coming toward me. This great multitude of Hecula, or Ohaloi, the beings dressed in the pretty feathers of these birds, are coming towards me. So it's a whole multitude, and they're just swirling around. You again get scared, and the master has to tell you again, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And so I just sat there. And the more I learned, the better it seemed. But I realized now, the more and more in bondage I became to it. And yet, looking back at everything, it all seemed so true. Everything just seemed like when I was looking at them, they just seemed so beautiful. There's a lot of the teaching and training process and um, initiation stuff that I can't share right now. There's just no way I could tell it. Everything that they did and everything that happened. At first his demons scared me to death and when he teaches me at night and then when he teaches me this night and this day and this night and this day and then they won't let me eat any food and drink, very little water and I'm taking drugs all the time, drugs and chanting and as many as the fingers on both hands. And then I remember hearing them say, don't eat, and so I can't eat now. And then they teach me in the daytime, they teach me at night. It's just going on and on until there seems like there's no end, no day or night. With all the chanting and taking dope, I couldn't sleep at night either. I couldn't sleep during the days, and so I got really, really tired and really, really sleepy. And because I wasn't eating, I was really, really hungry. And they would say, well, then don't be hungry. But I was hungry anyway. Then the one teaching me, um, because I was suffering so much from hunger, gave me the spirit of the frog's belly to keep me from being hungry. But I was still hungry. So day after day, it went on like this. And every session started with taking more dope, and taking more dope, and taking more dope. And then I would chant. I would chant all day long, and then all night long. Like I said, every session was taking drugs, and I was so, so hungry. And yet they kept saying, you can't eat. And so I just had to close my eyes real tight and hang on. Because of lack of sleep and lack of food, and you were only allowed to drink a little bit of water, I got really, really weak and very, very skinny. At the end of that time, down that long trail that the spirits of the pig have built, you'll see one being coming, and this spirit is the one that's going to be yours. And maybe there'll even be two spirits, but they're going to be yours, and they're going to come in there and start making a house. And at the end of this time, when these beings, when these spirits come, and they actually get inside your chest and begin to make their house there, then you are a shaman. There are different house builders. One is the spirit of the Malashi Liwa, and one is the spirit of the Ayakula Liwa. And the other one is the spirit of the Kulimoliwa. And these are the ones that first come in and build the houses. As these house builders cut up leaves for building the house, 
that they're building in your chest for the spirits, more and more spirits slowly begin to appear and to come in. As the house begins to take shape, they'll even call for the spirit of the anaconda to hold up the house with his strength, to stand up the house, up tall, and to hold it up strong. While your house is still taking shape, the master won't allow some of the spirits to come. One of the ones they'll tell you especially not to get is the spirit of the spider monkey, the Basho Liwa, because he jumps around so much that he can knock your fragile house over. If you're being initiated as a witch doctor after you've already been married, they don't want you to get the spirit of the Wisha Liwa, the Wisha monkey, because they say that it will make you extremely jealous of your wife and you won't concentrate on your activities of learning to be a shaman because you're watching your wife all the time and so jealous of her. You'll be so suspicious of your wife, you'll be watching her, and you'll be mad at her all the time, and so they really, really don't want you to get the spirit of the Wisha monkey because it's very jealous. And we're especially forbidden to get the spirit of the Huashi Liwa, or of the Huashi monkey, because it's a very mischievous monkey. And anybody who gets the spirit of that monkey just can't keep his hands off of other women. They were telling me all these things to watch out for with the spirits of the women. But as I didn't have a wife, I didn't figure I had anything to worry about. A good master wants to make sure you only get good spirits. He doesn't want you to be bothered by the spirits that can cause you to be timid or cause you to run away or cause you to be shiwali, to go crazy. And so we're told not to talk to the Haya Koaliwa and these different spirits they would name to us that they said would be bad for us. So our masters would try to warn us against those kind. Everything they told me sounded so true. It just sounded so true. And then they would come. Right now they would say, if Omana Yoli Makaba, if these leaves started talking, the earth, the roots, the big trees start talking to you. Anything that you come up against starts talking to you. Don't listen to them, because those are the bad ones, and they're going to lead you astray. They'll make you so you can't talk. My teacher was my future father-in-law, and he taught me tirelessly, and as a matter of fact, he spent each hour with me, chanting and taking dope, and he got just as tired as I did. This was the start of the bondage that I got under and kept me bound up for a long time. But we did have our benefits. One of them was, if you were fortunate, you could get the spirit of being the best shot. And how you got that was that you would get the spirit of the harpy eagle, or the hawk. They're the hunters because they're always eating other birds like the Hashimo and others. And they would come and give you an arrow, and that arrow would make you a very, very good shot with the bow and arrow to get animals. With these spirits to help me, it didn't matter if it was in the morning or in the middle of the day or late in the evening. Whenever I went out, I could always be assured of getting plenty of game because I was well taught. And that's why I can say I've been taught and I know what I'm talking about. The masters were very pleased with how I was turning out, and as I was maturing in the spirit world and getting more and more and more wealth and power in the spirit world, they were really pleased and they kept telling me, well, when you get a wife and when you have children, you're not going to have to worry about their health or what's going to happen to them or who's going to protect them because you're going to be able to handle that and you're going to be able to protect yourself and your family. My master began to put more and more responsibility on me, even telling me that when he was gone, I was fully qualified to take his place. And more and more spirits began to come to me, and more and more came. And they began to come in such numbers that it even became frightening to me. You could see them coming from far away, and they would come almost as an avalanche, as huge rocks falling off of cliffs. You know, they were coming in such numbers, their presence began to overwhelm me and almost crush me, like I was being crushed under all these rocks. 
Everywhere I went, the spirits began to make themselves known, more and more spirits. And listen, I'm not saying there's not Hecula, there's not spirits. There are Hecula, and it's easy to go into bondage to them. There are spirits, and they are deceivers, and they love to deceive. There are many different classes of spirits, some that live way up high in the rocks, some that are the spirits of animals, and some that are just there. We just call them Kuabawa. They're hanging around everywhere, but there are so many spirits that are just haters. They just hate everything, hate everybody. And if you get one of those spirits, oh, you're going to hate everybody, and you're going to go around and just kill children because you just hate everybody. And as a shaman, you're supposed to heal people. You're supposed to heal people, but if you have one of these hater spirits, when everybody's back is turned, you'll be secretly killing the children. These spirits are so dangerous, and I know what I'm talking about. And I recognize them, and I see them, and they're just haters, they're very dangerous, and they don't want to be seen by people. They just hate everybody. Because so many had the hater spirit, a lot of times when we would all get together, as shamans do, to take dope and to do our drugs, we would all run the women out of the shabano because it was just dangerous for them. We would send them to the gardens or something. Because when you're under the influence of the drugs, and when you've got your spirits, and you get one of these hater spirits, and he picks up his bow and arrow and starts to shoot at somebody, before you know it, your bow and arrow is in your hand and you're shooting at somebody. You're killing people. And so many times when we were getting ready to do this, they would hide all the arrows and the bows and the machetes and anything, and everybody would leave the village. The women and the children would all leave the village because if our spirit that we had at that particular time picked up his arrow and shot somebody, then that's exactly what we did. Many times we just hid our arrows and our bows and arrows, and there wouldn't be any bows and arrows left in the village at all. And they would hide the machetes too because it was too dangerous. Because if a hater spirit came, and they always came, and they took a bow and arrow, the first thing that you would do if you were dancing with me would be to look around for another bow and arrow to have, and you would shoot people that you were doing witchcraft with. Ones coming along, being initiated today, have no idea of all the dangers that are even involved. You'll just grab your arrows and just start shooting. You just have no idea what you are doing, and that's how it is. That's how it is. That's why I say when the demons just come in, and they just come running in, and they grab up their arrows and just start shooting, and then later you find out that it's been you who's been doing the shooting. And that's why everybody would let their arrows escape. In other words, they'd put their arrows away before we would begin to do witchcraft. As the demon comes dancing toward you, and he's dancing back and forth, twirling around and around with his arrows, and he's got his arrows in his hand, and he begins to make you really mad. He is angry, and he's white telly, and he's mad. So he starts to make you mad, and grabs up his arrows, and starts shooting, and you do too. And when you're dancing with your demons, the people around you look really, really ugly. They don't look like normal people, and the demons look beautiful. But people look ugly, and they just look hideous and bad. So that's pretty much what my life was. I was a shaman, and I was good. I took my dope, and I got in contact with the drugs, and I had Hecula Modima. That is, I spent all my time chanting to the spirits, the Hecula. That's just what I thought I would do from then on. But I began to lose control of my mind, and I couldn't control the sessions any longer. So my solution was to ask for a more and more powerful dope, to grind in more and more power to it. And even then, I still couldn't control what was happening in my mind. It was just, it was really starting to bother me. So that's how I was when we moved in our travels. We finally arrived at a place where you all know us. That's at Koshilo. And I was still losing control. But even in spite of that, I led a group of warriors, a group of men down to what they called Tama Tama. There were some Nabas living there, some white people. And that's where I met Joe Dawson.
We went down there, we paddled down in bark canoes, and we had to walk home just along the bank through the jungle. And I really lost control then, and I was afraid that it was going to be so bad that I was just going to lose myself in the jungle and never be found again. So I told the people I was with, I said, hurry, hurry, you need to get me home to the village because I'm really bad. But they started trying to get an armadillo out of its hole. And while they were there, I just took off by myself and I just ran and ran and ran until I finally collapsed. And I didn't realize it, but there was a big honeybee tree next to where I had collapsed. It was so big that it had multiple openings, one here and one above it. And as I was lying there unconscious, and these honeybees began to crawl all in my hair, they began to bite me and pull my hair like they do. And I finally came to, and I didn't know what it was. And I started scratching my head, and I realized that I was next to this honey tree. So I moved. And then that's where, while I was sitting there trying to get the honeybees out of my hair, is where the guys finally caught up with me. There's honey there. Eat it, I told them. They did. Then they got me back to the village. For me, that is definitely the worst episode to date, of where I just sort of lost it. I was irrational, and I had no idea what I was even doing. But in spite of that, the next time we needed to go down to Tama Tama, I went again. And it was on the second trip that I first heard about a different way. There was a young, uh, I think it was a Guahibo boy, living with Jim Barker, and he had learned a little bit of Yanomamo. His name was Julio Jimenez, and he talked to me. Jim Barker even knew a little bit of Yanomamo, but nobody could talk very well. We figured out later he was trying to say Shobali, the word for hell. But he said Shibali, which is our word for stingray. And he kept telling me in heaven there's no Shibali, there's no stingrays. So I didn't really understand what he was trying to say. But in heaven he said there's no hunger and it's real good and there's no stingrays. I found out later that the missionaries were even teaching him. So he was trying to practice on us what he was learning. He repeatedly kept telling me that Yossi was going to burn the world with fire. And what was I going to do to escape? It didn't make any sense to me at all. But I went home and told my Bhattakaba, my leaders, I said, these people tell me that in heaven there's no hunger, there's no, it's all beautiful, and it's pretty, and there's no stingrays. And we couldn't figure out what they were trying to say. I didn't understand it, and I didn't believe anything that I could understand, which was nothing. And I didn't even put it together with the legends we have of our own. But I went back and I told them what it was, and we tried to figure out what they could be talking about. And my father began to say, well, I wonder if they're talking about Shobaliwaka, which is the word for hell. And he says, I wonder if that's what they must be talking about. And he began to try and put it into something that we could all understand from what we had in our legends. See, we think like this. That in the heaven above us, there's a place where the spirits go, where the dead spirits go, and they live with Yalu, which would be thunder, and he has them there. But then above that heaven is the real heaven, where this Yaiwananabalewa lives. And up there it's just beautiful. There's a crystal water, just a clear, clear sea up there. And this supreme being, this Yaiwananabalewa, 
carefully, and they're looking down through the bottom of this lake. It is so clear that they can look right down through it and see the spirits of the dead. But up there with Yaiwan and Abalewa, that's in the real heaven. So my father said, maybe this Yossi is thunder, or maybe he's really talking about Yaiwan and Abalewa. That's the supreme being, the final one, the final authority. And we don't know very much about him at all, other than that he lives up in a beautiful land with all the Aboshikoli. And my father said, well, maybe he's talking about him. So he sent me back down, back down to Tama Tama. And I talked to your dad, Joe. See, this is what we believe. If you're a real stingy person, then when you die, hell is down here, and the trail to hell is real wide, and real flat, and smooth. But there's a Y there. The trail splits, and when you die, and as you're coming up the trail that goes to Thunder's land, where the spirits go away from hell, is to go straight up, straight up this mountain. It's a real steep trail though, and it is hidden. So Thunder sends somebody down to wait for him. He sends a spirit down to wait for him right at the cross in the trail, because they know when the person is going to die and when he's going to get there. And the person that died, his soul, his spirit comes on, and he sees this person from far away. The spirit Thunder sent to meet you will be sitting pretty close to the Wat, the split in the trail. And if you're a real stingy person, you're going to be coming down and you're going to see that person from far away, sitting there waiting for you, and you're not going to want to share with him. And so you're not going to want to approach him. You see him from far away and you stop and you turn your back so you can just ignore him. He sits down before he gets to the guy waiting for him. Because he doesn't want to share anything with him, and the guy that waits for him keeps calling, come on over here, come on over here to me. But the guy won't answer. He just turns his back because he doesn't want to share. After he tries calling the guy a couple of times, the guy just keeps ignoring him. Finally, he just points down the trail and he says, well, here's your trail. Go ahead, take this trail. This is where you're going to go. He sees the guy jump up and runs on by him real fast. And of course, that's the trail that leads to hell. And he falls into Shobaliwaka, and he's gone. When somebody dies that's a very generous person, it's the same way. Thunder sends a spirit down to wait for you at this split in the trail. And the very generous person, his spirit comes on down, and he sees the guy from far away, sitting at the trail, just sitting there. And so he runs up to him, and he's very friendly, and he says, come on, friend. Why don't you take me home, and let's get something to eat. So the guy gets in front of him, and leads him up the trail that goes to Thunder's house, because his spirit was generous. And because I already knew all these stories, when I began hearing about this God, and these other things, we just wondered if it was the same story, and whether it fit in with what I had already known. But it took me a long time to hear enough of the story straight, to really understand it. Because, remember, nobody spoke my language very well. The missionary Paowa had tried to tell me, but I never really understood. Also the missionary Cecilio, but he just talked to me again and again. I just couldn't understand what he was trying to tell me. It wasn't until I met Joe Dawson that he sat down with me, and it was really funny. I think it must have just been the Lord because at that time, Joe didn't speak very well either. But his love for me was obvious, and he was not afraid to touch me. I understood what he was saying, and I've always wondered about that. When he told me about the Lord, it was as if he knew my language perfectly, although he didn't. But I understood everything that he was trying to tell me. And he began to tell me, this is what God says. This is what Yaibara says, and this is what his word says. This is what he says is wrong. And it was so funny because I understood him clearly. I understood. 
Although there were other people talking to me who spoke better Yanomami, I for some reason could really understand him. And he told me, God loves you. And that was just such an amazing concept to me. To hear that and to really, really, really understand. For some reason, I understood it perfectly when he said, God loves me. And the demons and the spirits, the Hecula, that were living in me, they were inside my chest. They just got, they just got terrified when he said that. They made my chest shake. I came out of that time, after really understanding and hearing clearly that God loved me, and I came out just trembling. And like I said, the demons in me, they were just terrified. And I went home, back home, and I was telling all this to my dad. And I said, boy, it really, really sounds, sounds straight. It sounds like it's the truth. And what could this be? What could it be? And my dad said, well, I'm convinced now that they're talking about Yaiwana Nabalewa, the supreme being, the final one, that lives up there in that beautiful land with the Aiboshikoli. I guess you would call them angels. And they're up there in this place that's so beautiful that the sea is so clear that you can see right down through it. Because, my father told me, there's only two trails. As you know, after the split, only two trails. There's the trail that goes to hell, and there's the trail that goes up to Thunder's house, where the spirits of the dead of the generous go. And from there, they can look up through the crystal sea, up through that water that's so clear, and they can see up into Hedu land, which is the warrior god's land, and he's the final authority. And up in his land, he lives up there with the Abu Shakoli, and they're very, very noisy, just all the time, noisy, noisy. I know now that God's word says that they never stop praising him. But what we thought that they said, we probably got that from Satan, didn't we? But we said they just talked in gibberish, that they were just so noisy, noisy. And that's the only thing we ever said about them. And this is what they sounded like. That's the only thing that's up there after that. And my father was convinced that this Yosi that we were talking about was the Yaiwana Nabalewa. And as I began to hear more and more, I sat with Joe every day and I talked with him. And as I began to understand more, we would sit and talk, Joe, Millie and I. And it just seemed like each time we talked, they would peel away another layer of something that I had. And everything that I had was things like taking dope and drinking bones of the dead and my spirits that I had, the many, many spirits that I had, and my tobacco and the Wayamo chants. But as I began to see what God's Word said, and my spirit began to be opened up to what I was. And I had so much. There was the dancing and the chanting and so many, many areas that I had hidden. But as my spirit became more and more open and I understood more, Joe and Millie told me, they said, we're going to pray for you. An angel put their hand on me and ask God to open my spirit so that I could really see. And he especially prayed to have me released from the power and the bondage of the demons that I was under. And I just began to tremble all over and shake. I think that prayer really terrified the demons. It was at that time that I began to slowly feel like I was being untied. 
But after that, I would go down out into the jungle by myself. There was, there was a real quiet spot out there, where there was a huge tree that had blown over. So I'd go up in that tree, and I would just sit there by myself and think. And I would try to talk to God myself. I was still too afraid to even talk like this in front of Joe and Millie. When I'd get out there by myself in the woods on top of that big dead tree, and I'd tell Yaibata, I'd say, Boy God, what I'm hearing sure sounds good. It really, really sounds like you're somebody who could, who could untie, who can untie me and give me freedom. But I don't know. I just don't know, but it sounds really good. I knew that I was so in bondage. I was so tied up. It was like I was tied up to this big vine all over. And so I told God, I said, if you want to help me, then that's what I need. I need someone who can untie me from all these vines that have me all wrapped up. And then after that, I would go back and I would listen some more. And we would talk some more. And then I'd go back out and sit on my tree by myself again. And we would do this day after day. I'd go back out to my tree and I would just sit out there and I would tell God how much I was suffering and how much in bondage I was and how I had totally, totally lost control. And slowly, I became aware of all the things that I really, really loved. Oh, like my tobacco. Yes, sir, I really loved my tobacco. You know, a lot of people here still have a lot of trouble with tobacco. And I love taking dope. Having dope blown up my nose. And I love drinking the bones of our dead. These were all things that I think God was showing me that they were things I was putting first that were wrong and that they were in control of me. And, but yet there were things that I just loved to do. I admitted that all these things that I had, the women, the chanting, the singing of the songs, the singing of the spirit songs that I knew, I was ready to admit that they were wrong. But one thing I wanted to hold on to, I did not want to give up. I just wanted to hold on to it. That was mine. The one thing that I wanted to keep was, see, I didn't have a wife, and I was sharing the wife of a headman in the village. I tried every way I could think of to rationalize how this could be not such a bad thing. I mean, after all, I was willing to give up everything else but this one thing. This one thing I wanted to keep. So I went back out to my tree, and as I sat there, and as I was talking to God, I said, Father God, show me the things that are in my life that I'm still hiding. And this one thing that I want to keep, surely it's not that bad. And I really, really, I really want to keep this one thing. And yet as I sat there and I was thinking about God, and as I was speaking to Him, He told me that that one thing was sin. And that I couldn't, I couldn't keep it. This one thing that I had rationalized in my mind, this one thing that I had, it was the one thing that I needed to give up the most. He showed me that he does say, Thou shalt not commit fornication. 
And he also says, leave somebody else's wife alone. And I, and I was guilty. And he showed me that this was an area that I had to get rid of. I had smugly thought that I was okay, but God showed me my heart. He showed me that that was still there, that it had to be gotten rid of. Then I kept thinking back, well maybe I would, maybe I'd go back to doing or some of the old ways. So as I kept going back and talking with God, I became very serious about, about looking at sin the way that God looked at sin. So I asked God, I kept asking God, God show me my heart, show me the things that are wrong to you, show me the things that displease you, so I can get rid of those things, so that I can please you. Finally, in desperation, I told God, God, just make me like a little child. Make me like someone who has never, ever sinned again. I don't want to have anything that's between me and you, so that your word can really grow in my heart. Then I can begin to spread your word and make it grow with my people. So slowly, just like I asked for it, it began to happen in my life. Like when you eat and you toss away your scraps. After a while, you'd never go back to them and eat your scraps because it gets dirty. The things in my life that God began to expose me me were just like those konosikaba. It looked like those scraps that were just filthy, dirty. So I would challenge you, if you really want to have a close walk with the Lord, you need to get alone with God and just ask Him, God, show me the things in my life that you don't like. Because you know what I found for myself was as long as it was me doing the examining, I could always rationalize and it was okay. But when it's God showing you the things in your life, He shows you the truth and He exposes you for what you are. The more exposed my life became, the more God showed me layer after layer that had to be peeled away. The more and more spirits began to flee, and they just began to flee in panic, to get away, as God's word penetrated into my life. As more and more of my demons fled, Omawa, the chief of Hekula, of the spirits, was furious, and he was unwilling that I, that I would escape or that I would get away. And so he came to entice me to stay. He came running over to me and just running, running super really fast. And he was carrying a huge big black chain. And he put me down, and he got right in front of me, and put me in the center. And then he took this big chain and began to make a cage out of this chain, and to try to cage me in with it. But I don't know why, this cage just wouldn't hold me, and it just couldn't hold me. He would make this cage, and I would be outside the cage already. And then he'd put me there again, and he'd make this cage, and again I'd be outside the cage already. When he saw this cage couldn't hold me, he frantically looked around for something else that would entice me to stay with him. And you know how on the green parrot, the green parrot that has the lighter green tipped feathers on the tail feathers? He had a big bundle of those feathers, the paoshi, in his hand. And he came running back to me, really, really fast, with this big bundle of feathers. And he started dancing. He grabbed me by the arm, and he began to dance with me. And he had these really sweet-smelling feathers pressed up against my nose, overwhelming me with the smell of perfume, and dancing me around in this dance. It was just incredible, it was just so incredible. He really wants to, wants to get me back, and so he's got me by the arm, and he's dancing around me, and he's got these sweet-smelling feathers in my nose. And then he starts singing this song. And I've never shared this song with anybody before, but I'll share this song with you now. He sang to me a song of the power that could be had through the sweet smell and the feathers, representing the power that was in the spirit world. Well, it was such a beautiful song. It was so enticing and it sounded so good. And he was so convincing 
And that was the song that he made his final attempt on me with. And just as he was saying that, and singing that, and dancing with me, just right there, I mean, it was all of a sudden right there. I didn't look over and see it coming from far away. It didn't come from there. It didn't come from here. But as Satan came whirling back around me, all of a sudden I was overwhelmed. I had no idea anything was going to happen. And as he's dancing right there with me, and I'm fighting his, almost in his embrace, and he's got these sweet feathers under my nose, and he's singing and dancing, what happened was, there was just this incredible light. Just a bright, white, indescribable light standing right there beside me. Something grabbed me and just literally pulled me away from the embrace of Satan. In a voice I heard clearly, I heard a voice saying, Get away from him, he's mine. And Omawa turned and fled, just as, just as hard as he could run. And a couple times, he looked back as if he wanted to come and make an issue of it, and wanted to come back and fight. But the terror on his face was real, and he ran away. And to this day, I've never been troubled by any demon presence or anything since that day. That was the final time. And since that day, I've had the continued indwelling presence of God's Spirit in my heart. And as I looked around me then, it was as if, it's like, it's like when you've been sick for a long, long time, near death, and you're slowly getting better. And all of a sudden, everything is clear, and everything is, it's just like you're seeing it for the first time. Well, that's how it became for me. It was just, just incredible as God released me from the bondage of Satan, how new everything became, and how once again alive I was. If someone has been sick, and they've been given something real sweet to eat or to drink, and it really helps them, and they just say, Oh man, that hits the spot. That just tastes so good and felt so right. That's how God's Spirit did in my heart. It just gave me such a sweet, sweet feeling. And that's when I gave, that's what happened when I gave my life to Christ. This is what happens, because this is what happened to me. And I'll tell you, I'll never go back to that old way of life again, even just to tobacco. I would never go back to the things that I did in my childhood. I would never go back to it, to the drugs. I would never ever allow drugs to be blown up my nose again. I don't want to grab a hold of any of that kind of stuff again with my hands. I'm serious. So what do I say? I say, God, please protect my hands. And even though I'm old now, I still tell God the same thing. I say, God, protect me. Keep me from it, from evil. Protect my hands. Keep me from grabbing hold of something that is evil. Fifty percent of all profits from this video are designated to a special fund to sponsor Yanomamo Christians in evangelism to their own people.